obstruction followed by endovascular management and finally the surgical microsurgical management of dual diabetic fistulas so with these few words uh, i would like to i think we should not waste much time and the permission of uh, professor mohan sharma i would like to the speakers to kindly start their talk so first of all we we'll, i love to call dr pritam guru he is going to talk an introduction and pathogenesis of dual diabetic fistulas dr pritam please Oscar, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I like to. I am very grateful to Nelson and the organizing community for this opportunity to present. I myself, uh, Dr. Pritam Guru from Anupurna Neurosurgery Institute and Allied Science. Well, uh, well, I like to start uh, with the introduction. Well, dural arteriovenous shunt are direct shunts between the dural arteries and the dural venous sinus or cortical veins. They occur at any site within the dura, but most frequently they develop near the venous sinuses. They represent 6% of supratentorial and 35% of infratentorial vascular malformation. And talking about the etiology, the etiology is uh, mysterious, unclear, and However, it's, uh, the vascular uh, thrombosis of dural sinuses has been considered as, as a, a trigger to, to generate the, the dural AVF. Besides this, head trauma, infection, uh, de dehydration, transcranial surgery, hormonal changes like pregnancy and menopause are also the triggering factors. Well, uh, and besides that, uh, uh, there are also some uh, like hypoxia, which also leads to the angiogenesis, and there are angiogenistic factors also cause the dural avia. Like, like uh, this uh, angiogenic uh, uh, growth factors, like basic uh, fibroblast growth factors and vascular endothelial growth factors. But talking about the uh, presentations, uh, they manifest uh, with uh, different features like root, meters, clinical nerve symptoms, ocular symptoms, and Kind of raise ICP. Now I like to discuss about the stage in the formation of dural AVF. So uh, this is a uh, figure eight. It, this is the normal venous sinus. Normal venous sinus. So this is a sinus vein. This is a dura. You can see some arteries, and this is a uh, cortical veins, and what happens after thrombosis is there is a uh, backflow of the blood waste, blood flow, and after the uh, after the thrombosis, there is a impetus uh, that provokes the impetus, which uh, which causes the uh, formation and uh, um, formation of the fistula and uh, and nascent vessels. And that caused the generation of the dural arteries. And what happens in the stage uh, in three is uh, there is a partial recanalization, and, and in the stage E, that is stage four, there is a full recanalization. So this is a schema which shows uh, uh, what happens in the dural AVF is is uh, there is a there is a transverse sinus occlusion here, and there will be the feeders from the Hospital arteries and all the major arteries, and we can see the cortical reflex here. This figure so. Talking about the distribution of intracranial dural avia, small sigma sinus are more common, and, and then after the cavernous sinus and others, uh, we can see very rarely are in the anterior dural avia and superior sagittal sinus, anterior fossa, and and more rare is uh, anterior condyle confluence. I like to uh, discuss about the warden and warden and subarticular segment. This is a very uh, convenient and very popular. Uh, and this segment is depends on the venous drainage side and the cortical venous drainage. In, in type one, uh, type one is a benign type where there is a, a venous drainage into dural sinus and there is no cortical venous drainage. 
While type 2 and type 3 are aggressive, in type 2 there is a venous drainage into dural sinus and there is cortical venous drainage. In type 3, there is a venous drainage into cortical vein and there is a, a cortical venous drainage. And this is illustrated here. You can see the intubate flow here. This is type 1, type 2. There is a retrograde flow with the, with the venous reflux here, CBD. And in the type 3, the, um, so you can see the here, the cortical vein is here, and the reflux. This is the feeding artery and reflux in the cortical vein. This is more uh, uh, dangerous because of hemorrhagic. And it is a, there is also another classification by Coconut, uh, which was in 1995. This classification depends on the venous drainage and the flow of the whether integrate or retrograde. There is a integrate and there is a cortical reflux here. And the type 2A plus B, there is a occlusion here and there is a retrograde flow. And also in the cortical uh, venous drainage. And in type 3, type 4, and type, in type 5, there is occlusion here in the both side. There is no flow and, and, the, and the blood is going back to the venous. And there is also a venous ectasic change here. We can see the varix changes here in the type 4. While in the type 5, the drainage is into the spinal vein. We're talking about uh, different types. Uh, I'll, I'll talk in, uh, briefly according to the side of the dual labia. In the case of transverse sigma sinus, uh, it is a common type. And the presentation is uh, the present with, uh, uh, with hemorrhagics or intracranial venous hypertension, it is uh, found in only 11% of cases. While without hemorrhage, they, they present with the uh, postal teenagers, which is very common, which we uh, often uh, miss. So, uh, so the postal teenagers is very common in the dural area. Any type of, any type of dural area, postal teenagers is very it is an important sign besides this headache, for uh, visual disturbance, menstrual pain, or hospitalia, dizziness, hydrocephalus. What we see in the DSA is we can see the feeding artery from the like ECL, parenthesis, hospital, posterior, auricular, ascending pharyngeal, medial meningeal, and ascendial, accessory meningeal, and superficial temporal arteries. Besides this, we can kind of also feeding from the meningo hyperficial trunk and infralateral trunk, sometimes from vertebral branch. Was in venous range is transverse a sigma sinus, and this may be stenotic or occluded. This is a uh, illustration which, which we see in the transverse sigma junction. This is the purple color showing the shunt pot, where we can see the different uh, shunt point here, like this. And next is the uh, next common is the cavernous sinus dural area, which, which is also indirect because in direct we, we, we usually see the traumatics. So these are, uh, in this case, uh, people um, manifested with red eye, which is also called red eye sound syndrome, and they present with chemosis, subthalmosis, cranial palsy, and raised ICP, and interocular pressure, diplopia, also uh, positive tinnitus. In more than 50%, we see the, we can find the brood, brood also. And in DSA, we see the, uh, in the selective uh, DSA, from the from ECA, we can find the branches of feeding artery like internal maxillary, middle meningeal, accessory, accessory meningeal, and ascending pharyngeal arteries, and also for also terminal segment branches. Venous drainage is highly variable. Inferior venous drainage is, is typical, and enlargement of superior ophthalmic vein, uh, vein is frequent findings. So we see often the chemosis it, that is due to the enlargement of the superior ophthalmic vein. And cortical vein strain is present in 31 to 34 percent of cases, and and in the CC uh, in the cavernous sinus, uh, dangerous various uh, drainage is very uh, is also present. So this is very important to know because what happens is when we occlude uh, when this uh, drainage uh, drainage is uh, occluded, like in uh, SMCB and uh, like QB in uncal vein, breathing vein, they are more provoked to hemorrhage bleeding. 
So this has to be very, uh, this, this vein are very important, this training vein. And this training vein causes a symptom like if, a, if it involves a severe of the vein, then exophthalmosis, chemosis, and if it involves the SMCV or UV, uncle vein, infarction, hemorrhage, so on. And likewise, interior uh, weight flexes, uh, inferior fetal sinus safe sequence are tinnitus. And I'd like to discuss on the tendral DF uh, AVF. It is also known as superior petrol cell dural AVF, uh, which is located, located on petrol threes. And it's a three types, marginal type, lateral type, medial type. And they are, uh, they are present with hemorrhage in 80 to 90 percent. And they, and while in the on rocks of cases, they, they may be present with positive tinnitus, facial spasm, myelopathy, visual problems, so on. And what we see in the DSA is uh, like this, we can see the, uh, this kind of feeding arteries. Uh, because of time constraint, I'd like to skip the slides. And other, uh, other dural AVF is, so we can see in the anterior folds are like, which is also known as intimodal dural AVF or creepy form dural AVF. So presentation is uh, in 62% hemorrhagic. So another, uh, another type is uh, superior cell cell sinus dural ABF. This consists of 5% of intracranial dural ABF. So another rear is a uh, rear type is anterior condylar confluence dural ABF. Uh, this uh, represents with a uh, pulse synchronous root, uh, positive tinnitus, chemosis, proptosis, and diplopia, and also cervical myelopathy. And then, then feeding vessels are the uh, neuromeningeal trunk of the SNDF flanger arteries, mesial glands of spiral arteries, and petrocell branches of medial meningeal arteries, posterior auricular arteries, posterior meningeal glands. And venous drain is uh, into the intradural frontal vein, and also uh, in the marginal sinus, anterior internal, vertebral venous plexus. So uh, besides this, I'd like to also uh, describe, uh, this was about the spinal epidural and dural, uh, spinal dural AVF. Spinal dural AVF are the most common vascular sound of the spine and men are more uh, common. And uh, we can, uh, they are very common in the thoracolumbar spine according to the location. And they are most of the clinical uh, manifestation is progressive myelopathy. Spinal dural AVF is fed by the radiculomeningeal artery located on dural matter of the spinal nerve root sleeve, they, and they drain into the radiculomedullary vein. While the spinal epidural AVF are rare sons, and they are also manifested with the radiculopathy, they are located in the epidural space and drain into the epidural veins. This figure shows a relationship between the, the medial interpedical line and the shunts. This is a, the red line, so the medial interpedical lines. What uh, this line is important is, uh, according to this, we can see the shunt point here. Here we can see the shunt point with the RMB, which is a uh, lateral. And while in this case, uh, this, the shunt point is uh, draining into the breathing vein, which is uh, located on the medial side. So this uh, line helps to look at the site of the lesion. And sometimes in angiography, uh, we also see in the, this is an important sign, this horizontal T sign, uh, which is uh, the, which show the longitudinal relationship between the feeding artery and the draining vein here. And besides this, uh, so we can also see the uh, tural AVF in tiny cervical junctions, which is very rare. It is one, two percent. They are, they also manifest with the, uh, like subregulate hemorrhage in the spine and the intramedullary bleed. So with this, uh, I like to conclude. Uh, so transfer sequence uh, sinus dural AVF is very common. The so natural history of dural AVF depends greatly on the presence or absence of CBD. And the important thing is uh, dangerous drain side drainage in the camera sign is very important. Thank you. Okay, Dhanabad Pritam, nice presentation. So we'll keep the question answer part in the later part of our session. 
So we move on to Dr. Manoj Bora's presentation straight away. Dr. Bora. Thank you, sir. So can you see it? Yeah, yes, yes. The slides, yes. okay. So yes. good evening, everyone. Uh, so the topic of my presentation is endovascular management of intracranial dural AVF. And uh, the clinical features have already been uh, described by Dr. Pritham, but I'll just focus on the major ones, like the pulsatile tinnitus, which is uh, one of the most uh, common features. Uh, and uh, the other one is uh, ocular symptoms, uh, mainly chemosis, exophthalmus, and uh, diplopia in some cases. And uh, the other uh, aggressive type, uh, which Dr. Pritham has already explained, they can present with cranial nerve palsy, increased ICP features, local neurological deficits, and also uh, intracranial hemorrhage. So the diagnosis is mainly by CT, MRI, and the cerebral angiogram is, of course, gold standard for diagnosis. So I'll just uh, briefly talk about each. Uh, usually, non-contrast CT has no findings if unless the patient presents with hemorrhage. Uh, in the contrast CT or CT angiography, we can see some tortuous feeders, enlarged dural sinuses, as we can see here. The, uh, can you see the arrow here? On right side, the cavernous sinus has been enlarged compared to the left side. And uh, as Dr. Pritham had also mentioned, that superophthalmic vein is uh, dilated is enlarged in case of carotico cavernous fistula. So we can see the SOV very clearly enlarged as compared to the left one. This is superior ophthalmic vein here. So CT can provide some important findings. So in MRI, we can see mainly the flow voids in T1 and T2. This is T2 where we can see like right transverse sigmoid region, the flow void. And in the same patient here, we can see the fistulous point is here. And we can see the right side transverse sinus is dilated, it's enlarged. And on MR angiography, we can, although it is very difficult to uh, interpret it is uh, like <clears throat> in detail, but uh, we can appreciate that there is a dural AV fistula by MRA. But as I already mentioned, DSA is the gold standard and we need to do complete six vessel angiography, like bilateral internal carotid, bilateral external carotid and bilateral VAs. So to see feeders from all the possible uh, arteries. And also we need to do super selective angiogram uh, from the feeders. So we can have much detailed information of the uh, feeding artery and the uh, sun point uh, as well as the draining uh, veins. Like in this uh, example, this is the occipital artery or branch of ECA, external carotid. So this is the super selective angiography of occipital artery. So we can see this is the fistulous point and then the draining vein into uh, transverse sigmoid sinus. So that is very common. We can see the transverse sigmoid here. So it is draining ultimately into eyes AV. Uh, so this is the fistulous point here, we can see. So uh, the DSA gives us complete uh, information about the flow because only looking at uh, just this picture, it's, it's difficult to say the flow and also cortical venous reflexes. So the, we need to uh, interpret it. Uh, the NGO architecture needs to be interpreted by watching the video of the flow from arterial phase to the venous phase in detail. So the angiographic evaluation, the first is arterial feeders. So it is important because uh, we can have an idea of access to trans arterial embolization. So how do we access the sunt if we need to treat it? And the other very important information we need to know before treatment is dangerous extracranial, intracranial anastomosis. Like the very common one is middle meningeal arteries uh, anastomosing with ophthalmic artery. And if we don't know this information beforehand, and if we try to occlude the anterior frontal division of MMA, and if it is anastomosed with ophthalmic artery, the patient may land up with blindness post treatment. So there are other important branches from MMA, that is petrosal branch, which uh, arises more proximally. Uh, so if we occlude MMA more proximally, so the petrous branch may be occluded and the patient can have facial nerve palsy. So these are very important information we need to have uh, by angiography beforehand, before the treatment. 
So the other important point we need to know by angiography is uh, uh, evaluation of the fistula spouts and the venous outflow whether the drainage is anti-grade. This picture was already shown in first presentation. Very beautiful picture. We can see the occipital artery here, feeder, and then draining into transverse sigmoid. But this is anti So this is the anti-grade flow we can see here. And this, is the, this is the type two, which has a retrograde flow and the cortical into the uh, vein of labe having cortical reflex, reflux. So, and also the, this gives the information if we want to go, the, uh, go for embolization through transvenous route. So, angiography gives us very important information. So, DSA is a uh, gold standard and it is a must before we go for treatment. So, <clears throat> now the treatment. When do we treat intracranial dural AVF? Because it is a rare lesion. Uh, it may not be that rare because uh, I think the most important uh, clinical feature is tinnitus. And uh, many patients may land up in ENT with that feature, and they may not be evaluated with uh, DSA. So we may be missing so many dural AVFs because tinnitus is the most common presenting factor. So unless they have ICS, uh, they may not come to neurosurgeons. So uh, for tinnitus, we may not treat the patient unless it is very uh, troubling, like affecting daily life of the patient, because it, it may be just a benign type of dural AVF. But uh, that if the dural AVF is aggressive, like high risk feature, mainly cortical venous drainage, which can present with hemorrhage, so we need to treat uh, such uh, aggressive type of dural AVF. So the treatment is endovascular, microsurgery, and radiosurgery. So I'll be focusing on endovascular modality of treatment. So the, the treatment of dural AVF is complete obliteration of the fistula. So if we only obliterate one of the feeders, it doesn't treat the fistula completely. So, uh, so I'll talk that in uh, later slides, but there are two approaches, transarterial and transvenous approach. Uh, both have their own pros and cons, uh, but transarterial approach has slightly more risk because uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide of uh, ECIC anastomosis and the dural branches supplying the cranial nerves. So, and transvenous approach, we need to avoid creating isolated cortical venous drainage after embolization. So the materials used for embolization, uh, these are the first four are liquid embolic materials. This onyx, it's uh, most commonly used, it's even available in Nepal now. I have used, uh, I have done one case of dural AVF in Nepal and I used onyx in that case. So NBCA, fill, squid, these are all liquid embolics. And the other uh, material we can use is uh, detachable coils. So regarding the approach of transarterial, transvenous, and also the material, this is a very good paper which was published in neurosurgery last year. So long-term outcome of endovascular treatment of indirect CCF. So three decades uh, study, and the obliteration rate was 86.5%. And obliteration rate was higher with transvenous approach, more than transarterial. Because as I mentioned, there are many feeders for one fistula. So we need to obliterate all the feeding arteries and going transarterial to every artery may be practically very difficult. So going through transvenous route has higher rate of obliteration rate. And also <coughs> coils have been found to be more effective in occluding the sunt uh, rather than liquid embolics. And also complication with coils is uh, few because the liquid embolics can fly away to many important branches, uh, so which is not under our control sometimes. So quails have been found to have uh, less complications. So this was another study in 2020. Uh, this is of intracranial fossa dural AVF, multicenter series, and the conclusion is almost the same. Transvenous route is more effective uh, and less, uh, uh, with less complication than transarterial route. Uh, so the complete cure on follow-up was 95%. So endovascular treatment has been the first choice uh, recently for uh, dural AVFs. So I'll be showing one representative case, a 63-year-old man with right-sided pulsatile tinnitus, which is the most common symptom, and which has been progressive and affecting daily activities. Uh, no other significant examination except an audible brew behind the right ear, which is the typical location. Um, so I'll be directly going to DSA. We don't have much time. <clears throat> so. This is a left-sided external carotid artery angiogram, and these are the ascending pharyngeal artery. 
and uh, neuromeningeal branches of ascending pharyngeal artery. So uh, I think uh, we need to study the angiographic features uh, very detail to understand all these architecture. But uh, in simple APA, that is ascending pharyngeal artery, is also one of the very important feeders for dural AV fistula in this region. And we can see that even in arterial phase, here is the fistulous point and then draining into internal jugular vein here. And this is the reason for enterocondylar confluence, enterocondylar vein going into internal jugular vein. So this is the normal protocol. We do it under general anesthesia. Uh, I puncture right femoral vein uh, because I'm not comfortable directly going through internal jugular vein. So, and we always use heparinized saline and uh, loading dose of intravenous heparin before uh, starting the guiding catheter procedure. The activated clotting time is maintained between 250 and 300 seconds throughout the procedure. And uh, uh, there were two catheters placed in left external carotid. We placed the diagnostic catheter and embolization is done from right side, right internal jugular vein. So transvenous approach was used uh, in this case. As we can see, there is a guiding catheter in right-sided internal jugular vein, and this is the fistulous point. So the microcatheter is introduced up to the fistula here. So these are the devices used, so I don't want to go into details of that. So coils were used, as I already said in two papers, they have already shown coils to be much more effective. So the coils were used to obliterate this fistulous point here. So after embolization, we can see the angiography doesn't show the uh, fistula here so it is completely obliterated so in this case we need to be very careful like not to pack it very tightly in any cases of dural av fistula we need to be very careful of post treatment uh, cranial nerve pulses so here hypoglossal canal is very near also in the next slide so this is post treatment ct so we can see the hypoglossal canal is here if we very tightly pack with this with the coils so the patient can have hypoglossal nerve palsy post-treatment. So this anatomy should be uh, very useful for treatment. So this paper was published uh, two years ago in our journal. <clears throat> so this is a very common type of, uh, most common type of dural AV fistula. So 36 year old male presented with right-sided ischias, seizure and left uh, deficits. And then on angiography, we can see like most common feeders for transverse sinus fistula is middle meningeal artery here. This is occipital artery, OA. This is posterior auricular artery. Sorry, I haven't labeled it. And uh, draining into vein of labe. So this is a very dangerous type of fistula as it has already presented with hemorrhage and also posterior cortical vein. So this uh, case I, I would like to show because the approach is different and the material used here is also different than the previous one. So this case was done by arterial approach going through middle meningeal artery. And uh, this black material you can see is the onyx here. So slowly pushing onyx and gradually we can fill all the fistulous pouch with the onyx and also slightly into the drainers here and then stop. And post treatment angiography shows obliteration of the fistula. So trans arterial approach can also be very effective in these cases because MMA is very easy to approach. And uh, this proce procedure doesn't take much time and uh, it is relatively safe. And the material used was onyx here. This is another exam common fistula that is carotid cavernous fistula in direct one. The patient present with typical symptoms, chemosis, exophthalmus. And here we can see the superior ophthalmic vein is dilated. And on angiography, we can see this superior ophthalmic vein is dilated here. This is cavernous sinus here. So after occluding the cavernous sinus with superior ophthalmic vein with coils uh, by transvenous route, we can see the post-treatment angiography shows <coughs> obliteration of the fistula and there is no venous drainage. We cannot see the superior ophthalmic vein here. So I'm just showing this in very brief. So as we know, like this is the common saying, all roads lead to Rome. There, are, there may be many pathways, many things going to the same point here but we need to choose the safest road so we don't harm the patients and we need to choose the transarterial route uh, via which branch or transvenous route uh, studying the NGO architecture of the, of the individual case uh, in very detail and then plan the embolization. So this is our cath lab. 
So I thank you very much for your kind attention. So thank you so much. Great, great, great presentation, Dr. Manoj. So we move on to the next presentation by Dr. Hazan Raza Ranabat. Uh, he is going to talk on the endovascular man management of spinal dural APF. Cousin, hello. Hello. Yes, please uh, load your yeah, presentation. Yeah, is. Okay. okay. Can we see my slides? Yes, go to the slides so far. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Now I will continue with the endovascular management of spinal dural arteriovenous fistula. Uh, I'm working as a neurointerventionist in Randy International Hospital. So Dr. Pritham has uh, mentioned this, but I will briefly go into the pathogenesis of dural uh, AVF in the spine. It makes 70% uh, of all spinal vascular malformations present late. 85% constitute male, and this is in contradiction to the intracranial dural AVF, which is more common in female. And this may be found from foramen magnum up to the sacral level, any level, but most common is lower thoracic to upper, upper lumbar level. And this information helps us uh, while doing catheter angiography. I will describe it later. And they typically present with progressive symptoms. Now, I would like to briefly uh, talk about the pathology itself. And each segmental level, the segmental artery gives rise to a radicular artery. And this radicular artery gives a radiculomeningeal branch. It also gives radiculomedullary branch. This radiculomedullary branch constitute, hello, am I audible? Yes, yes, audible. Okay. So this uh, radiculomedullary branch makes the anterior spinal axis in addition, the radiculopile branch also make the posterior spinal arteries. Now, as this radiculomeningeal branch pierces the dura and supply the dura, we can find sometimes an abnormal shunt between this radiculomeningeal artery and a radicular vein. Now, this draining radicular vein is essentially a single vein, and it drains intra intra dural. If this shunt is draining extra durally, then it, it may uh, constitute an epidural AVF rather than dural AVF. Now, mostly this, mostly this shunt is found in the dura accompanying the nerve root exit. So mostly, like uh, Dr. Pritham said, we uh, mostly find this near the neural foramina. Now, when this shunted blood reaches the lower resistance perimedullary venous plexus, there is a reversal of the flow. Now this blood starts flowing uh, upwards in ascending towards the thoracic and cervical level. And we have to know that the, the venous drainage in thoracic level is mostly convergent in contrast to the uh, upper cervical level, which is divergent. This makes uh, it, it more difficult to shunt more uh, uh, coming blood so more and more venous plexuses are recruited and there is a massive congestion that starts to uh, get along. And as the cord also gets congested, it start to starts to swell up. Now, as uh, the con congestion starts, the, the veins start to get arterialized. There is reduced arterial venous pressure gradient. This increases the spinal venous pressure and there is decreased drainage of the normal spinal veins. Now this congest venous congestion leads to intramedullary edema. Now, when we get the patient at this stage, it is considered uh, like uh, the, the pathology is still reversible. But once the tissue uh, starts to get uh, decreased blood supply, or there is ensuing of uh, chronic hypoxia, then the, the cord starts to go myelopathic changes, cord atrophy, and after this, 
we can just stop the progression of the disease by obliterating the fistula and most of the um, symptoms are not reversible. So there are primary neovascularization that is due to new capillaries within the cord. There are even secondary neovascularization that is sprouting angiogenesis from venules. And this is after there is chronic hypoxia that settles in. And end stage venous congestion will finally lead to venous ischemia. Now the progression of this venous ischemia typically starts from the lateral corticospinal tract. Slowly it progresses to the funiculus, lateral funiculus, and also involves the adjacent uh, white matter. So these will um, uh, start, uh, start to uh, destroy the descending uh, autonomic tracts as well. And it, it, it uh, progresses to the anterior gray matter and the posterior columns. So it is um, established that the anterior spinal beans are relatively spared towards, even towards the end. So the, the anterior medial part are said to be relatively spared in spinal dural AVF. So whenever we suspect a patient with spinal dural AVF, the first screening modality is MR or MR angiography. And uh, spinal catheter angiography is typically done to confirm the diagnosis, as well as differentiate between the epidural, dural, and perimedullary arteriovenations. Now, spinal angiography is the one that can differentiate between epidural, dural, and perimedullary arteriovenations because because um, the clinical features and even the MR features of all these sons are the same. And even after we do a MR or MR angiograms, many a times we are uh, left with no clue where the level, level, exact level of the fistula is. And lastly, angiography, we, we can do embolization on the same setting or on a follow-up. So typical findings in um, early stage of spinal dural AVF is intramedullary edema, which is seen as a hyper T2 hyperintensity signal. Sometimes in cross section, we can see a thin rim, hypointensity rim around the cord, which is due to the um, deoxygenated blood in the um, dilated perimedullary capillaries. So sometimes there can be a non-specific diffuse kind of contrast enhancement. Uh, but the most typical finding is these flow voids that we'll see in the posterior CSF space, particularly posterior CSF space. We can even see that in the contrast imaging. And these are more uh, clearly seen in heavily T2 images, like we do CIS or Fiesta sequence, or sometimes contrast 3D small uh, 3D um, turbo spin sequence, we, if we do in very thin section, we can even sometimes uh, will be able to uh, demonstrate the shunt itself. Now, if the MR demonstrate the shunt, it becomes very easy to do catheter angiography because we don't have to probe each and every segment. We, can, uh, we have an idea where to find the shunt. If the patient comes in late stage, then it, they, they, will always, uh, they will already have myelopathic, myelomalistic changes with cord atrophy. Now, if we happen to see the T2 flow voids in anterior um, CSF space, we have to suspect perimedullary dural, uh, perimedullary AVF rather than dural. And we can see the crowded congested vessels in cross-section imaging. Sometimes and there are a few articles which uh, suggest that sometimes they, they may represent the level of the shunt, but might not uh, hold true all the times. Now, if some MR shows these variously dilated pouches with the contrast stagnation, then we have to suspect there is a high flow shunt rather than low flow shunt like dural AVF Dural AVF are considered to be low flow shunt compared to perimedullary AVF. So this will be typically seen in perimedullary AVF rather than dural one. So sometimes uh, there may be uh, mimics like compressive myelopathic changes and uh, 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 the contrast enhancement of astrocytoma or cord infarction or multiple sclerosis, but these all will have some additional findings and without the posterior CSF space T2 flow voids, so not much uh, confusion to be made by these uh, pathologies. 
So when we go to um, catheter angiography, one thing I would like to uh, uh, say again is that like even the clinical features and MR may not tell us where exactly the level of the fistula is. So uh, doing catheter angiography of uh, dual AVF is um, a tedious job because we have to probe each and every segmental vessels bilaterally and we may sometimes land up making selective angiograms like 30 or 35 or even 40 from um, from top to bottom. So typically we start with uh, lower thoracic and upper lumbar first because these are the most uh, common uh, places where we can find the dural AVFs. And then if we don't find or we suspect additional fistulas, then we start probing other. Now slightly, uh, I would like to tell anatomy, like uh, the segmental artery, we, uh, we what we aim in doing spinal angiography is we first try to establish where the level of the shunt is. If we find a shunt between the radicular meningeal and a medullary um, vein, then we try to find out if that is a single shunt or is there any other shunt or is there any shunt bilaterally. And if for even one shunt there it is not uncommon that it has multiple feeders, like multiple metameric feeders or feeders from bilateral uh, radicular meningeal arteries. So that has to be con confirmed before uh, we jump into um, a conclusion about a fistula itself. Now that is one aspect of uh, spinal angiography. Another is we have to establish whether there is cord congestion or not. For we and uh, we have to find out where the level of the radicular medullary arteries are constituting the anterior spinal axis and the posterior spinal arteries. If the radicular medullary arteries happen to be supplied by the same level as the shunt, then it becomes a trouble treating them endovascularly. And mostly we, because we don't have a safety margin to embolize and such patients rather have to be taken by surgery. So this is a typical hairpin loop appearance of a radicular medullary artery constituting the anterior spinal axis. And these are the radicular pile arteries making the posterior spinal arteries. Now, this is an example of um, a dural avicent. Like we, we can see the, the catheter tip here, and this is a segmental artery. Mm, this is a posterior branch. This is a radicular meningeal artery giving a shunt. Now we can see early drainage vein. And that the shunt point is uh, easy to localize because of acute transition in the caliber of the diameter. When, when, we, when we go from the artery to the venous, there is increase in, acute increase in the caliber. Now, this is another uh, example, like probing the L3 segmental artery. There is a radicular meningeal artery giving a shunt. At the shunt point, we have a venous pouch. And then there is progressive uh, dilatation and congested perimedullary venous plexus. In contradiction, this is another uh, case. Well, when we probe the segmental artery, we can see this is a radicular medullary artery rather than the meningeal. We can see the continuation of the anterior spinal axis. The descending branch here is giving a shunt. And there is early venous drainage and congestion. So this is a, a pile AV shunt rather than the uh, dural AV shunt. So the purpose of DSA is to identify feeding artery and early draining vein to establish the shunt characters, evaluate secondary changes, to see if there is stasis of contrast in ASA and evaluate the venous congestion, how much congested is the spinal vein. Now when to treat. Uh, treating spinal dural avishant is uh, already an indication, like diagnosing uh, spinal dural avishant is an indication of the treatment because it is eventually give the myelopathic changes. The goal of the shunt is to occlude the shunt zone or to, uh, um, to exclude the draining vein from the shunt. That will stop the progression of the cord edema. And that can be done by endovascular as well as surgery. But um, endovascular treatment is uh, the initial attempt of choice whenever possible. The only uh, established contraindication is like I said, the anterior spinal or posterior spinal artery originating from the same pedicle as spinal dural avision because it will not give us a safety margin to uh, push our embolic material. The, the, um, 
Objective is to occlude the distal feeder, to occlude the shunt zone, as well as occlude the proximal draining vein. Now this part is very important because unless we um, occlude the proximal draining vein, like, uh, like uh, said by Dr. Monos in intracranial case, this pouch will start to recruit its supply from anywhere it will give. So the, the prognosis depends on how successfully we can occlude the proximal drain vein. The agent of choice is like um, low viscosity liquid embolic agent like uh, glue or onyx that has to penetrate up to the proximal drain vein. Mm, proximal occlusion with coil or gel forms are kind of contraindication because if we if we happen to incompletely occlude or uh, let's say for example if there is recurrence then we will lose our proximal access and particle embolization is also not mm, desirable because they are prone to recanalize this is uh, one of uh, a case we have treated during my training like uh, for 57 male with progressive weakness, the present, he presented with cord edema and then a lot of congested vessels in the posterior CSF space and even cord enhancement. There was a, a shunt between the radicular meningeal artery and a, a, a medullary vein from bilateral, both right and left T6 level. And luckily the, the radicular medullary supply to the anterior spinal axis, the Adam Kiwis, was at T9 level. But this was delayed, uh, delayed was out because we can even see this beyond 20 seconds. So this, this is how we see for the spinal cord congestion. So bilateral super selective uh, uh, embolization was done. This is glue cast seen in the shunt from bilateral and post embolization there is no shunt, no early venous drainage, but we can see this blush of the vertebral body. So one month follow-up, see uh, we can see that there is a complete resolution of the cord edema. Another 35-year male with similar um, uh, paralysis and bowel bladder in, uh, involvement presented with cord edema and then the posterior perimedullary venous congestion. congestion. This patient also had a radicular meningeal shunt. But here what I want to show is there is in addition to the shunt, the, the, uh, we can see this hairpin loop supplying the posterior spinal artery. So these are radiculopile arteries supplying the posterior spinal artery. So this uh, becomes a, um, another good candidate for endovascular treatment and this patient was taken up by surgery. Sometimes this uh, dural shunt can be associated with multiple other shunt like multiple perimedullary shunts. And sometimes even there can be um, metameric syndromes. So these kind of patients will have to be evaluated very carefully. We have to have a 3D um, uh, imagination, like uh, all these select super small, individual super selective uh, uh, angiography have to be combined uh, and then evaluated very nicely. And then uh, multi-stage treatment have to be planned for these kind of patients. So post treatment, what to expect is we have to obliterate the shunt completely, which is uh, successful in up to 72% in one meta-analysis. The ASA and PSA have to be patent and the venous drainage have to be intact. If we suspect we have over penetrated the glue reaching beyond the proximal drainage vein, then um, it's wise to use uh, IV heparin for the next 24 hours. And it is also advised that if cases that have like a descending drainage, not just ascending drainage, um, anticoagulant are uh, also advised. Complication uh, reported are up to 3.7%. And um, uh, I have to say this complication, though it is small, it is higher than the, the one reported from uh, after surgery. And two main complications are spinal cord ischemia. If we fail to recognize, like I said, the ASA and PSA originating from the same radicular artery. And if we over penetrate the draining vein, then there can be thrombosis of the spinal cord venous system. 
How is the prognosis? Depends on the duration as well as the disability the patient will present. Like a progression of the disease can be stopped in most cases, but like not all the symptoms can be relieved. And this has to be clarified to the patient prior. The, the patient should be clear about what to expect from the, the procedure. And this becomes a very important part of the management. Post-operative follow-up, like without improvement, even after four to six weeks, or the patient deteriorate, we have to keep in mind that there, have, there might have been a recanalization of the shunt, or a secondary shunt might have opened up. So we, we should consider a repeat MR or MR, MR angiography. And usually the MR uh, findings lag behind the clinical findings. But still, if MRI shows that there is persistent flow voids, then a DSA is indicated. So for spinal dural AV, AVF, uh, take home messages are it's most common vascular malformation in spine, presents in elderly, located near the uh, nerve root exit and lower uh, thoracic to upper lumbar level. There is, this is a sound between the radicular meningeal and a radicular vein. Clinical presentation might be nonspecific, slow progressive paraparesis due to venous congestion. Early MR finding is cord edema, late is to confirm the diagnosis. And endovascular treatment is gold standard. And uh, surgery now um, a days will be preserved in whom um, the contraindications are uh, there for in the vascular treatment or there is recurrence. And on the same note, I would like to say that um, dural AVF are not so uncommon disease like we think uh, because uh, uh, dedicated MR like uh, things like time of flight MR or uh, DSA is required most of the time to pick up these cases. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranavat. So uh, we'll do, do the question and answer in the later part as usual. So moving on to the next presentation by Professor Amit Thapa, the microsurgical management of cranial and dural, spinal dural AVF, please. Uh, and thank you, Monsa, and uh, thank you, Pritam, thank you, Manoj, and Kajan for a very elaborative and lucid presentation on the topic, and this has made my work very easy. So before I start, let me declare that there's nothing for, um, relevant to be disclosed, and I will be talking solely on a pure dural AV specialia, because as you know, dural AV specialia may be associated with various other pathologies. But then in this presentation, I will be talking purely on a uh, exclusive case of a dural AV specialia. So I will begin with this quotation. If you fail to prepare, you are prepared to fail. So that's why we have to get prepared with every pathology which we may encounter in our life. Because sometimes, from somewhere, these things will come up and if you do not know about it, then it will be difficult for us to make decisions. This was a famous saying by Mark Spitz. Uh, this was a person, um, an American writer and a very well-known uh, swimmer who actually uh, recorded seven gold medals in a personal uh, best which was only broken recently uh, by Michael Phelps, another swimmer, who actually get, got eight gold medals. So he was won over by only one single gold medal extra. Uh, so, well, what we have seen over this last uh, 10 to 15 years is this much treatment that's, uh, for uh, dural AV specialia has changed over the time. When my practice started, we were still doing microsurgery to a lot of limits because that time endovascular treatment was uh, not coming up with a lot of modalities. And with, but, with the introduction of Onyx, a lot of things changed. So this was a paper which was published in uh, two, uh, 2010, and it was published in Germany. And it actually was uh, talking much more of a surgical treatment with a pretty good uh, elimination rate of 97.6% and a permanent surgical mobility of 7.1%. And the authors went on saying that the microsurgery should be considered early in the treatment. But what happened over the years, that we can see that this was a publication in 2020, and then the authors are actually quoting the surgical management of dual AV special has become so rare that even case reports and accompanying videos are valuable contributors. So that's why the surgical intervention has decreased over the time. And uh, this was an online book which was published in 2020 by NCBI Bookshelf, and it again shows that because of this uh, uh, 
a rarity of the cases and the rarity of the surgical approaches no universal guidelines can be made for clinicians however an integrated approach is recommended and that's why at this particular webinar we have uh, radiologists uh, neurointerventionists as well as uh, the uh, neurosurgeon talking on this issue why they were it as uh, dr kitten said told about benign and aggressive as well aggressive in the form because uh, these ad specialists have been uh, shown to cause non hemorrhagic neurological deficits meaning the ischemia or intracranial hypertension and even can lead to hemorrhages even the dural ad specialists comprises only 10 to 15% of the ad malformation uh, but then the complication it can actually arise is almost 10 to 15 times more than the avm it has been calculated that the overall mortality because of the dural ad specialists need can be around 1.6 per year But in a high grade of AV fistula, it can even reach up to 100 percent where the patients can have ICH or non-hemorrhagic neurological deficits. So leading to an ICH in 8 percent per year as well as non-neurological hemorrhagic deficits in 7 percent per year. And that's why we are always on the guard to see these patients either developing an intractable cyst symptoms or the growth of fistula or developing hemorrhages for that reason. Now there are certain predictors which can tell us whether there is an aggressive behavior of these patients. So the predictors are the venous drainage pattern. If the venous drainage shows a very few formation or a venous dilatation, if there is a cortical venous regurgitation or a draining into the lacrimalingual venous system, gallium drain, or is there an element of venous transtonosis or cerebral sinus thrombosis, there is definitely a chance that these particular lesions can show aggressive behavior. Also, the location is very important. Say, for example, in a tentorial incisura and intracranial fossa, these DV fistulas are also been shown to have lot of aggression. However, the caveat is there is no location which can be considered benign, and any change in tinnitus or brew actually warrants evaluation. Now, what are the evaluation options available? One is the conservative therapy. The second is microsurgery. The third is endovascular embolization, and the fourth one is hysteretic surgery, which I will be talking. as the case is being so conservative therapy is basically recommended for type borden type 1 or in cock in a uh, uh, in in other words type 2 or type 1 or type 2a eh? in which the lesions do not have a cortico venous regurgitation so these are asymptomatic or having a tolerable symptoms but these patients need to be observed because even in the borden series they have found that almost 2 to 3% patients have a chances of developing a cortico venous regurgitation and that's why these patients can can actually go into aggressive format So these patients can be either followed thoroughly by doing an MRI, MRA, or DSA every three years, and any change in symptoms need an extensive evaluation for the aggressive nature. Now, this was a publication which was uh, from a center which uses both radio surgery, embolization, as well as surgical treatment. And what they advised was in, in the cases of type one, this is actually the Borden classification. If the patient is symptomatic, then we can just observe. If the patient is symptomatic, then they can be given an endovascular treatment option. And if in case there is a residual or the location is in the tall pillar, then we can consider radio surgery. And in the type two and three, the patient can undergo endovascular or surgical options. So as you can see in this particular combined fistula integrated approach, also most of the patients were actually advised endovascular treatment over the surgery. So why this fear from surgery? That's so the basically this fear has actually arose because of the fear of a blood loss, and that's why most of the uh, articles actually talk of surgical indications in, in cases where the endovascular therapy fails or are incomplete, or where the endovascular therapy is not feasible. But then this is not true. Why? Because if we see the location based uh, uh, of, of the dural ad fistula, then almost 75% of the fistula which are located either in transverse sigma junctions or peritoneal cavernous uh, dural fistula, which are very well amenable to endovascular therapy. But as we go to the anterior cranial fossa, that is the entry, that is the small dural ad fistula, or when we talk of tentorial dural ad fistula, there the endo endovascular therapy are not the successful. And these are the three categories of ED specialists where the surgery is actually being shown to have much more better results as compared to embolization, even to till this day. Now, goal of surgical treatment is basically cure of the lesion. And if in case we cannot get the cure of the lesion, then we can have to convert the lesion from a high risk specialist to a low risk specialist, as well as to palliate the symptoms by different interventions. So, for this reason, the surgery actually encompasses three different surgical strategies. The first, which has the absolute chances of complete cure, is a complete ex excision of the fistula. 
Now, as we all know, the difference between the fistula and the avium is the absence of the nidus. So that's why there is no nidus to excise. And as Kajan has also mentioned in his slide, that by disconnecting the arterial feeder is again it's not a treatment because the vesicular vein can actually generate much more feeders from all around. And so the most important thing is to disconnect the arterialized vein from its compact with these feeders so that we can get a complete excision of this fistula. The second strategy is to disconnect the the sinus system, which is getting the, the retrogranage drainage from these meningeal arteries or the feeders. Now, this actually is done by split arranging the dura, or by or the first surgical strategy can be direct vexing the sinuses and then packing the sinuses so that there is no more a retrograde regurgitation of the uh, of the of the uh, of the vessels into the um, into the um, uh, venous sinuses. But then the complications are uh, that these are technically not that easy. There's always a risk of heavy bleeding and also the risk of venous infarction. If the, the risk of venous infarction yeah. is much more there if in case we are uh, uh, we are actually obstructing the pathway of the normal venous drainage of the brain. So that's why these are the different complications which are expected with surgical intervention. Now, according to the modern classification that you see in this graph, there can be two possibilities. Either there will be a re, uh, there will be a retrograde drainage of the meningeal feeders into the direct venous sinuses. In a, in a sense, where there's an end, possible enterograde sinus also, uh, sinus drainage. So in this case, we cannot, uh, we cannot um, uh, sacrifice the vein, venous sinuses. So in these cases, we just do a surgical skeletalization of the sinus. That will just uh, cut the, uh, the, the dura all along parallel to the venous sinuses so that this particular retrograde filling is stopped. Um, however, if in case the, fish, the sinuses is completely blocked and it is only allowing a retrograde regurgitation from the meningeal feeders, then we can actually open the sinus and can pack this with oxidized cellulose, which has been recommended by the previous authors. <clears throat> in type 2 modern uh, uh, types of dural fistulas, if in case there is a regurgitation into the leptomeningeal veins together with an integrated drainage of the, uh, of the meningeal feeders into the venous sinuses, and again, we have to disconnect this cortical vein as well as we have to surgically sclerotize these uh, the sinus all over from in a parallel fashion. And then if in case there is no anterograde flow inside the venous sinuses, then again, we can go for surgical packing of the sinuses. Now, modern type C, which has been actually have been associated with the highest risk of uh, intracranial bleed is actually much more amenable to surgery. Ask me why? The reason is because there is the sinus is all intact. And because of which the, uh, the retrograde drainage is directly into the leptomeningeal veins, leading to the formation of the lact, uh, venous lactoneus. And these particular sinus uh, venous uh, connections can actually be, be coagulated and cut on an uh, open exposure much better as compared to the endovascular approach <clears throat> because these particular connections are located far away from the sinuses. So that modern type C is much more amenable to surgical treatment. Now, when to operate? In patients with acute hemorrhage, if there is not an emergency, unless there's a symptomatic mass, then we can actually work up these patients completely and operate within the two to three days. But remember, the studies have shown that chances of re-bleed is very, very high, up to a tune of 32% within the first two weeks, if in case these patients are not managed appropriately. However, in symptomatic patients, these patients should be operated after proper evaluation. Now, how do you plan? We have already talked about CT and MRI, but from a surgeon perspective, whenever we are given a three-vessel DSA together with a super-selective catheterization, we first have to see whether this is a dural fistula or not. The basic problem is to identify it from a uh, different it from an AVM. So as for the diagram shows, AVM should have a parenchymal nidus as compared to this meningeal based uh, uh, fistulas, which are dural AV fistulas, which do not have a, a nidus inside the parenchyma. Similar, similarly, we have to identify where the fistula is because we have to operate on these patients. So we have to open only that compartment where the fistula is. So that is always very important to identify the location. Then in 10 to 15 percent, multiple fistula has been identified. So we have to rule out many presence of multiple fistula as well as multiple uh, draining veins. Usually in the AV fistula, there is one single draining vein, but then there may be multiple draining veins also that has to be looked for in the uh, DSA as, as much as possible. And then we have to identify the need to be treated. And then how do I get to the fistula? That is the approach. And then what to get do when I get there? That means we have to either skeletalize the sinuses or we have to cut the cortical veins. So that has to be identified by looking at the classification according to the body. 
Now, beside this, the most two important things which we have to see is basically the uh, the venous phase, the, uh, the the arterial phase where the intracranial veins actually just appear dilated from the meningeal, as is shown in the right-sided figure. And in the venous phases, we have to see the presence of the absence of the cortical venous drainage, venous sinus occlusion, direction of the flow. And the most important thing is the, the, the indispensable veins, like vein of labi, are they draining the normal brain or not? Because until and unless we have not identified these particular structures, we are not allowed to sacrifice them in the surgery. Now, how to do the surgery? Basically, it starts with the, with the exposure of the skull and the bones. So now in these patients, there are a lot of uh, feeders from the meningeal aspect. So that's why the, the patient's exposure can a little bit bleedy. And in these cases, that's why we have to go layer by layer, opening and then closing the bone uh, uh, with the bone wax as much as possible so that we can actually uh, decrease the bleeding from the superficial exposure. Usually the bleeding occurs much more commonly whenever we are trying to expose a midline uh, parasagittal sinuses or the anterior cranial fossa tumors because these are much more drained by the, uh, supplied by the mini middle meningeal arteries uh, feeders. Uh, then we have to aggressively cauterize, clip and devascularize the dura as well as circumferentially as much as possible. And to tackle the venous sinuses, we have to first of all make an idea whether the sacrifice is safe or not. If in case it is safe, then we can circumferentially incise the dura on both the sides and then we cut and ligate it. But then again, in the present literature, this is not being recommended. They say that you can just ligate and you can leave it rather than cutting it off. And then uh, the other thing, if in case it is not safe to cut the spinous sinuses, then we can just skeletize it and leave it like that. Now, the most important thing in these particular type of dural ABF is to find it, the, where the fistulous communication is. And in these cases, neuro navigation helps a lot. So by using a CT angiography film, you can actually tag it in a neuro navigation and can actually identify the first segment of the leptomeningeal draining vein. Uh, there are various other methods by to intraoperatively find out these fistulas, either by using temporary clipping, micro doppler, or intraoperative fluorescent angiography, which I will be talking in the subsequent cases. Now, the most common amenable sign the dural AV fistula to surgery is anterior ethmoidal sinus dural AV fistula. So you can hear these are the preoperative scans and these are the postoperative scans. In the preoperative scan, so these are the fistulas point uh, where the fistula is there. So in the operative exposure, this is basically an eyebrow incision. So I just like to orient you to the uh, to this uh, slide. So this is the fox. This is the anterior uh, orbital roof, and the brain, the frontal lobe, has been retracted with a retractor. So you can see this vein dilated veins here, and then after connecting this con this um, arterialized uh, vein with a um, uh, clip, you can see the whole venous dilated venous system has collapsed. So these are the uh, ethmoidal uh, sinus dural AV fissure, which has to be coagulated and cut. So first we have to apply a clip clip, then we coagulate this segment and cut it. <clears throat> this is another case of a 63 years male who presented to us with an intracranial bleed. Now this patient was in very in a poor GCS. It was hardly five in this case, and it was a massive hematoma. And uh, on doing a CT angiography, which we usually do for all the patients with a non hypertensive bleed, we could see there was some amount of dural venous sinuses, the dilatation of the sinuses on the dura. And then we actually, since we did not have navigation there, so we used the, the navigation which was achieved by the appearance of the clot and the relation of the clot to this uh, dilated veins. And then using an intraoperative ultrasound, after draining the clot, we found, we made the brain lax, and then we found that this was a fistulous connection there. So we coagulated and cut it, and then the patient started improving, and the next two weeks, patient was able to be discharged properly. This is another case of sagittal sinus dural AV fistula, but then this was actually draining into the, uh, uh, the fistula was from the appearing from the fox. So you can say there are multiple uh, dilated, uh, uh, dilated um, arterialized veins. So what we do in this case is we actually coagulate it so that we can shrink it uh, to a level that there is a single uh, feeder communication. And then towards the venous side, we apply two clips and then coagulate and cut in between. So this is the only therapy and you can see a very good recovery uh, in the post-operative angiography. Now coming to the third most uh, amenable um, uh, dural AV fistula, that is the tentorial dural AV fistula. Now, tentorial dural fistulas, according to the Lawton, has been classified into six different types. Either it will be draining into the galenic vein system, that is the galenic AV dural AV fistula, or it will be draining into the straight sinus sinuses, that is straight sinus dural AV fistula, or into the torcula, or into the on the tentorial sinuses, 
or it will be a petrol superior superior petrosal sinus dural ave fistula or insurial dural ave fistula now the beauty of these six types is that out of this six pore are basically draining into infratentorial spaces so most of the exposure in these pore that is the torcula the uh, the straight sinus the torcula the straight sinus the galenic type um <clears throat> and the superior petrocell will be actually draining infratentorial hence for the exposure will be infratentorial however the tentu the, the tentorial sinus dv dural ave fistula and the insusterial dural ave fistula will be draining, draining supratentorially and in these cases we have to expose from the uh, from the uh, supratentorial exposure so just to explain here so in this galenic type of uh, tentorial ave fistula we can say most of the draining veins are actually going into tentorial but then in this case we have to approach to the interhemispheric approach that will be above so as to see the angulation here in the straight sinus uh, dural ave fistula the draining vein is actually in tentorially so we have to open through a infra tentorial sub supra occipital approach in the torcula we have to expose four dural compound compartment that is the um, right bilateral occipital dura bilateral sub occipital dura the fox and the tentorium and so in this case we have to do a torcular uh, craniotomy exposing all the six dural leaflets and then in the tentorial in uh, tentorial um, uh, av fistula this actually are draining in the uh, floor of the occipital lobe and so the exposure will be sub occipital exposure and then we can actually calculate and cut the draining vein here in the uh, petrous uh, superior petrosal uh, uh, dural ave fistula the draining vein is basically superior to petrosal sinus uh, so that's why we have to expose to a retrosigmoid approach in extended one and by which we can cut it we have an example for this so i will be di displaying it further and then in the uh, tentorial uh, insusera or the uh, the petrosal apex dural ave fistula it actually drains in the uh, floor of the tentorial in the temporal the temporal fossa hence for the exposure would be either perianal or subtemporal so by this we can actually go to the base and can remove it now this is an example of a superior petrosal sinus dv intural av fistula so the patient is exposed through a retrosigmoid approach and you can see this is a seventh nerve <coughs> seventh and eighth nerve complex so this is an ica and these are the dilated superior petrosal vein and this is the border of the petrous bone now so this is the tentorium this is the dural ave fistula so these are the, all the dilated uh, veins as, as well as the varices on the, um, for, after that particular fistulous point now this slide is very important if, if you can appreciate here here this is a pre operative image where you can see the whole arterialized venous system is all bright red but as you apply a temporary clip onto the fistulous communication the color of the vein venous system actually turns blue and this is a sign that this is the fistulous component if you just clamp it the all the fistula size actually decreases and it becomes a uh, dusky in color and also you can use a micro doppler probe which is shown in the figure below so you can see on the micro doppler probe you can see the flow actually decreases as well as if you have a facility of an indocinin green angiography interoperative fluorescent angiography you can actually mark it very clear, uh, clearly that after applying the clip the flow inside the vein actually gets obliterated so that's another method by which you can identify intraoperatively that the your finding of the fistulous connection has been proper and adequate now coming to the transverse sigmoid sinus dural ave fistula now these are actually being managed much more endovascularly but then if in case if the access point is not available or if the patient is having a problem um, which can be generated because of endovascular therapy then microsurgery approach can be done and in this case again either we can do a packing of the sinus or we can do a skeletal addition of the venous sinuses according to whether the sinus is intact or uh, it, it is allowing an integrate flow so like as in this figure this particular uh, in the figure on the left side actually shows there is a retrograde uh, flow but then it is also allowing some amount of anterograde flow inside the venous sinuses so in this case we cannot sacrifice the transverse sinus plus if you see the vein of lab is also draining into the venous sinus so treatment of choice would be skeletalize the sin venous sinuses so we open the, we just uh, cut through the uh, the dura on either side of the venous sinuses so as to to skeletalize it and that's why it actually it stops the any uh, retrograde regurgitation of the venous sinus however if you see in this particular slide on the right side there is no anterograde flow rather all the flow is actually going to the retrograde in the vein of labi so in these cases we have to actually preserve the vein of labi to the maximum but then we can actually uh, open the sinus and pack it 
with the oxid oxidized cellulose so that we can actually close this particular sinus from feeding the leptomeningeal veins uh, retrogradely. Now, cavernous sinus dual leaking fistulas nowadays nobody is doing a surgical excision or surgical obliteration of the cavernous sinus because there's always a problem of cranial nerves being injured while packing. What is surgically is being done is uh, it is being used for superior ophthalmic vein approach, which has been devised by Hennekin in 1989. Now, I will not talk in detail in this particular, this can be talked in later classes. Uh, the other modality is for a magnum dural AV fistula, which is basically a marginal sinus fistula. I show this video because uh, this films because of one important thing. Whenever we are actually opening the dura, we should always try to keep the, the arachnoid intact because all these dilated veins and the vessels can actually come out in case we open the pia immediately with the, with, the gush, with the surge of the CSF outflow. And if we see, this is a new technology of Carl Zeiss, which uses flow 800 to quantify the blood flow. So apart from the three techniques which I showed earlier, you can also use a flow 800 technique by which you can quantify the arterialized uh, vein. And then after putting a, a temporary clip, you can see this, uh, the flow is completely stopped. So this can also help you to identify intraoperatively whether this particular vein is an arterialized vein or not. Now, outcome depends on different factors like degree of neurological deficit and symptoms. And uh, we should always expect that after closure of the fistula properly, the pulsatile uh, tinnitus, seizure, visual problems they actually improve significantly. However, the stroke which has occurred cannot be cured, but any new neurological deficits can be prevented. And areas of edema and hypertension will improve and resolve. And all methods, however, have their own complications and actually adds to the morbidity. So this has to be well explained to the family. Now coming to the spinal dural AV fistula. Now uh, the classification which we usually use regarding type one, type two, type three, type four of this type one and Robbie? type four are basically AV fistulas. Yes, sir. Uh, short one. Uh, next five minutes we we'll finish. Right? Yeah, we have, we have six. three slides more, three four slides more. So in this particular dural AV fistulas, one and two are the dural AV fistulas, two and three are AVMs. So I will not be talking of two and three. So in type one, it is basically the, the communication between the radicular meningeal artery to radicular vein. And then so it is very much located near to the dura. And you can actually call it as a dural AV fistula. However, the type four is basically draining into the perimedullary vein. And so it is a perimedullary uh, fistula. So this is a type four type where you can see the perimedullary veins are actually distended three of almost five to seven times the normal venous structures inside the, inside the uh, pia. So these are the perimetrally types. So surgical indications are basically type one and type four types of uh, AV fistulas, and even type two AVMs can also be can uh, can also be tackled surgically. Embolization is uh, uh, if in case embolization is not possible because of the arterial feeder is a segmental medullary artery that is it is supplying the cord, then you cannot do an embolization. And in cases of technical different difficulties or failures, then surgery is advisable. Now, in the type 1 malformation, which Kajan has already shown, so this is the operative photograph. You can see this is a route from where this particular official communication is there. And you can identify it on a uh, um, video ICG. And then this particular vein is actually isolated and then cut by after applying two microclips. So we usually do not leave microclips inside the spinal canal because there's a small space. So we only apply it for the time for the time being and once we coagulate and cut it then only we release the, uh, the, the clips. Type 4 is basically managed in the similar manner. If we compare the literature the occlusion rate achieved by the surgery is has been uniformly from 95 to 97 percent as compared to endovascular. Even with the use of onyx the, the success rate in the spinal navy dural fistula has not gone above 77 percent with a comparable complication rate. And the most important thing is the incidence of recurrence and the potential to cause catastrophic injury, which is very much seen for in the patients with the endovascular embolization. Now with the advent of MIS, as well as ICG video angiography, a lot of things have been simplified in the spinal dural AV fistula surgical intervention. Depending upon the several factors, again, the outcome matters. What we have to explain to the family is that gait difficulty, muscle strength, can actually respond very well after the surgical treatment. However, symptoms which are because, which are due to micturition problem, pain, or muscle spasm may respond very less. So the treatment is actually directed to halt the progression of the symptoms rather than reversing them. So this has to be very well told to the family members. Now, just a slide on radiosurgery. Even though gamma knife is being 
being promoted uh, by different uh, authors in the present literature, we have uh, thoroughly seen that radio surgery is only advisable for those patients who have a non-aggressive urology fistula, that is modern type 1 or common uh, type 1, type 2A, which does not have a risk of hemorrhagic episode. Right. Reason why? Because after giving this particular radio surgery, there's 15 to 20 percent bleeding rate per year. So that's why it is not advised for, for a higher grade uh, AV, AV fistulas. And uh, these are only done for those patients who have an intractable symptoms or those patients who have after surgery or embolization still have some residue. <clears throat> so to conclude, the goal of treatment is obliteration or disconnection. There, but then there is no place for incomplete therapy because these patients are uh, always prone for aggression as well as uh, recruitment from the surroundings and then the patient's symptoms can increase. This is a multidisciplinary approach considering the patient factors so that's why the whole team should sit together and talk about what is best for the patient. So according to the uh, literature, the first line treatment for cranial deviated fistula is definitely embolization. However, surgery is indicated in particular locations like in anterior ethmoidal fossa EV fistulas as well as in tenturial EV fistulas. And the, it is also indicated in those cases where the endovascular treatment fails. However, in the spinal dural AV fistula, surgery is a superior treatment modality and radio surgery is defined for benign with intractable symptoms. So with this uh, slide, I end here and uh, we will like to have questions after this. But uh, with the permission of the chairpersons, uh, let me start the post-test session. Am I, sir? Okay, please, uh, Amit. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. We'll go to the multiple choice question for the CPD, then we'll go into discussion part. Okay. Thank you. So the slide in the front will show you www.menti.com. So you can enter the code or you can just scan the QR code and it will lead you to the website. Okay, so I start here. I don't know what's happening, why it is going into. So question is, which of the following can be a clinical features of dural AV fistula? So the options are pulsatile tinnitus, chemosis, focal neurological deficits, is a combination of A and B or a combination of A, B and C. Okay, so most of us has answered A, B, and C, and that is the right answer. Now the question two. According to Borden classification, if the lesion drains directly into a cortical vein, then it is classified as type one, type two, type three, or none of the above. So now five seconds remaining. Okay. Let's see. So most of us have answered type three, and that is the wrong answer. That is the right answer. Now we go to the question number three. 
correct statement about spinal dural AV fistula is, so you have to choose one of them. Classically, in elderly male with chronic spine with chronic progressive spinal symptoms, abnormal fistula between radicular meningeal and intradural radicular artery, most commonly found in neural foramina at lower thoracic to upper lumbar, and obliteration of the shunt may not achieve all symptoms but stops progression. So, and the fifth option is all of the above. Okay, so this time again, the maximum people have answered the right answer. So now to the last post-test. Intervention is advisable in all but one dural AV fistula. In other words, in which of these cases you can actually observe the patient. If in case dural AV fistula is draining into the venous sinuses without a corticovenous regurgitation, if there's a change in tinnitus or brewy, severe visual loss on the initial diagnosis, or if in case it happens to be a Borden type 2 or type 3 dural AV fistula. Okay, again, so this time majority have voted for the right answer. Now there are two feedback questions as usual. So what do you think the present webinar has helped you with? So you can choose as many options as you think it is appropriate for this presentation. Okay, and then here is the final feedback question. Do you recommend this presentation to your peers? You have to select the one which you think is the most appropriate one. <clears throat> you can keep on answering to this question. I stop share and then uh, uh, hand you back. Uh, Professor Mohan and, and Dr. Yam, sir. So. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. And Dr. Amit, for uh, doing that uh, MCQ also. Yam, shall I say something, Yam, and then you continue for the spinal? Yeah, please, sir, please, please go ahead. Yeah. So it was a very comprehensive presentation, and uh, all four speakers did their job very nicely and uh, covered almost all part of the this very important though it's very uncommon it told by dr yam in the in the introduction part of the present of this session it's a very it's a very uncommon topic actually in, in the in a neurosurgeon's career they will see maybe 10 to 20 cases and all the recommendations which have been given are based on all these retrospective case series of 10 or 15 years so it's very one Decision making is the most important part in the in any neurosurgical problem, and it holds true in dural AVF. You know, and the the one the the com the the classification system which is used is Borden classification, and one grade one usually goes conservative, whereas grade two and three they they have to undergo some kind of intervention, which could be surgery, endovascular, or hysterectomy. And clinical presentations are basically divided into non-ICS and ICS. Those who have got the ICS have a different ball game as opposed to those who do not have ICS. And there is uh, one component treatment called partial is also recommend, sometime recommended. Whereas in classic uh, uh, arterial venous malformation with NIDAS, there is no such thing as partial treatment. But here sometime, you know, you can, to alleviate the symptom, you can do partial also. And uh, this is what I uh, like. I summarize about all the presentations, uh, related presentation. So, if there are any questions and comment, please. I see Dr. Pont here, right in front of me. Please do some comment, Dr. Pont, sir. Yeah, unmute, Governor Porio. Unmute, Governor Porio. Mic, mic on. Other on mute, sign other. Pontasar, please unmute your mic. 
बोले को मात्र लिप्रिंग गर्न पर्ने भयो बोले को सुनिए हैन ओके आई एम ऑन यू नाउ यस यस प्लीज मैं अलग मिस करे है प्रेजेंटेशन साइकिल भर्खर आर अलग मिस्टे करें तर अति मैं उसको अमित डॉक्टर अमित को एक्सटेन्सिव एजुकेशनल स्लाइड्स हेन पाए राम लगे है एटा मेरा आपको ओपिनियन अब डॉक्टर मोहन ने भाया जस्त अल अफ अस हेव भेरी लिटल एक्सपीरियंस अन यू नो दिस बिकज इट्स ए रिपेरी भेरी रेयर डिजिज मोस्ट अफ द टाइम वी डोट हार्डली यू नो अल अफ अस हेव डन लेस दैन टेन इन आवर करियर एकदम ठीक कुछ हो खाली के मैं सिके को देर अल डूरल एविएफ डू नट निड सर्जरी स्पेशली अन दोज डूरल एविएफ विच आज अन ट्रांसफर साइनस ट्रांसफर सीगमोइन रिजन को डूरल एविएफ हर दीज आर सेकेंडरी टू अक्लूजन अफ ट्रांसफर साइनस and if you try to operate on this because that is the only channel that they have you know and then if you try to operate and occult that then there will be disastrous you know result so uh, they have to be left alone and they should not be operated it's a clear indication for surgery a koi le kai yo kuro cha hamile birsinjo ra koi le kai phata phuta yesto chiz har pani dekhira huncha aphai le pani garya chu maile ra har le garya pani dekhaya chu tyo le gara hese इंटरभेन्सन द बल गेम इज अन इंटरभेन्सन एंड अबियली इट्स लेस इन्वेजिव तर कहीं एकदम सुपरफिशियली लाइंग डुबीएफ छू जस्ट ओपन दैट एरिया जस्ट यू नो अक्लूड दैट पार्ट एंड एवरीथिंग इज कन सो सर्जरी इज एब्सोल्यूट भाई जो लगे मैं मैं चाहिए Yeah, Amit. Amit wanted to speak something first. Let Amit speak. Oh, uh, thank you, Basan Sir. Abdul, I'm going to ask you a question. Sir, 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 I'm going to 2015 पर चीजें हैं यार कि the lot of surgical literature has diminished why because uh, most of us actually think that the surgical reason थी थी जरिए intervention करो नहीं ना कि बने रहते हैं तर ऐसा ही हमने जो मैंने यहाँ पर review literature पर नहीं करे तो सब एक पूरा करता है कि रहती है इस model variety तो सब एक कुछ tutorial जोड़े लेगी तो शिला में से still पनी सब एक surgical intervention को operation रहे एकदम ही high रही है Reason kids have been actually since I could not tell in the presentation earlier. I will just like to reiterate on these two points. Anterior ectomedial artery, जोन आप branch होंगे तो जो optal में काटे को branch बाहर निकाल दा in branch artery route पाता से जानू मिल जाएगा. Why? Because there's a chances of optal में काटे getting a loss and the patient can go into optal can go into visual loss. Similarly, anterior AV fistula is मतलब क्यों रही था बनाएगा क्योंकि the most of these features are either caused from vertebral artery or from ICA. Now these two arteries are very different from ECA. ECA को feeder जरूरत है इंबोलेशन को नुस्खा जिलो यहाँ बाद जानो पनी नुस्खा जिलो तो ICA र तब एक और वर्चुअल आर्टरी मानो बिट्टी के त्याग से तब एक और से बिनस एक्सेस पिटी राम रहूं दे ना तो इन्हें को feeder बता होने रही है तो अंदर जोरल इंस्पिशन है मतलब सर्जरी को main principally क्यों रही सब ना कि not to cut the arterial feeders but to disconnect the arterialized vein. Now arterialized vein का तो कि जोरा बात एक ऑफ गरे को � So that's why it's modern variety more attentively we in a sexual mating case and a surgical approach modality ramro so bane and we have access it very properly then we will directly hitting on the this particular venous sinuses which are coming out you are very well said sir even michael lawton ne pani jin publication gare ko chan tenturel av durel is special ko classification mai le ko tab kare that was only based on 42 cases so michael lawton mane ko hazaro hazar case gare ko man thiyo kiti even gata kheri pani hardly evi fistula ko series ma dherai chaina hune ko raicha pani so the evi fistula as um, dr pritam has rightly put up only comprises 10 to 15% of evi malformation so these are the problems uh, thank yeah, you dr amit hello 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 
Hello. Uh, Fazil, you want to you want to speak something? Yeah, uh, I wanted to share my experience regarding dural AVF because uh, where I trained in Syria's, they do a lot of dural AVF, either spinal or intracranial. They have done over a thousand cases, and I was lucky to uh, during my one. Uh, more than one year stay, I saw a lot of, they do like one or two cases every day. So my, what I want to share is like um, uh, for uh, tentorial sinus, like uh, Dr. Amit said, it is a little uh, less accessible. So mostly they take up for surgery. For uh, transverse uh, sigmoid sinus, they are usually larger. And uh, one of the clinical factor we are missing is a lot of patient, mm, the clinical symptom is dementia. So more, many of the patient, they, they came with, uh, they, they were uh, diagnosed as um, dural AVF because they presented with dementia and were uh, elaborately uh, uh, evaluated with MR. And then in MR, unless we specially look for the feeders in transverse, and then uh, refer to uh, DSA, maybe we will miss. That's why uh, in, even during my presentation, I tried to say that it is a little underdiagnosed case. And dementia, um, even I have a, uh, written a paper with a, a series of 77 cases of transverse uh, sigmoid dual AVF and 10% were dementic patients. So this thing I would uh, like to share and then uh, 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 they even do um, uh, stenting of uh, transverse sinus to collapse the feeders. And this has uh, given a quite few good results in some of the cases. Well, uh, I'd just like to add two points uh, to Kazan. Well, Kazan, you very well raised this point of venous congestion. So if in case of the, the radiographic evaluation only says venous congestion without any velocity irritation or because of other reasons, then definitely involation is one of the treatments of choice where you can actually block the feeders only rather than disconnecting the, the venous channel. And second, regarding the MRI, well, there are other people also who are radiologists in this particular meeting. I just wanted to know because the recent literature actually quotes about a protocol which is known as time resolved contrast enhanced MR angiography. In the Siemens machine, it is called as TWIC, um, or rather a 3D trick. And then in other machine, it is called as TWIC. So this trick imaging, is it possible in Nepal? Because it has been shown to have very, very high uh, chances of picking up a dural AV special as compared to the other modalities. Uh, we didn't uh, uh, have that uh, sequence, but we used to diagnose a lot in even the time of flight uh, MRA. And uh, that has to be done in the thin section. Um, and time of flight MRA is also as good for picking up this uh, arterial feeder from uh, most of the ECA feeders. And uh, another thing I, I want to add is like um, uh, this Borden and Cogner classifications have been widely used, but they uh, not all types of fistula are included in these two types of classif classifications. Sometimes like Cogner misses uh, uh, direct cortical uh, uh, fistulas or even isolated sinus fistulas. So what uh, they used to classify in Seriras was simply classify as benign and uh, aggressive. And benign would also, uh, aggressive would also include those fistulas that have just retrograde venous drainage without cortical venous reflux. Because their experience had been like, uh, if there is court, uh, retrograde drainage, they will eventually go into um, cortical venous reflux or at least functional obstruction. Agreed. Agreed, Dr. Kazan. Actually, cortical venous drainage is the ultimate decision maker, whether the patient needs aggressive surgery or we can uh, ask them to uh, ask the patient to continue conservative treatment. Agreed. So cortical venous. There, there may be other people who want to say something, please. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, if there's no question, I'd like to ask a question to Kazan because uh, like he's experienced so many cases at his center. Uh, any any cases of hydrocephalus have you encountered? Because you've been exposed to so many cases of fistulas. Uh, 
with particularly with uh, dual AVF, no, no, I, uh, I haven't seen hydrocephalus. With so that's, that's, that's supposed uh, to be one of the, you know, one of the presentation. It could be one of the presentations due to the increased venous pressure leading to obstruction of the C. Yeah, with AVM, with AVM we have seen, but with uh, dual particularly, uh, I couldn't see during my my tenure there. Right, thank Same you. For a dual. So regarding vein of gallon. Hello. Vein of gallon also. Cousin. Vein of gallon AVF. What was the? Vein of gallon AVF uh, with hydrocephalus, sir. Mm. That must have been the common thing. Uh, that is uh, hydrocephalus due to its vacuum rather than venous congestion, I think. Okay. Because uh, because of the melting brain. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, before you speak, can I uh, can I just continue my? Yeah, please. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Mohan Sir has said about this uh, cranial uh, AV fistulas. Uh, regarding the spinal ones, I'd like to give a few comments. Uh, I've also not seen many. I saw three in Veer and one I did over here in the last 10 years. So basically, basically is a 40 year, is supposed to be a 40 year old male, you know, presenting with uh, generalized uh, progressive weakness and at the level of columbus spine and diagnosed by angiography. And compared to the cranial ones, if it's a simple type, surgery has got very good results because you see a small laminectomy or laminectomy can access, you can access it. And more importantly, if necessary, like you can even sacrifice the root. So surgery has got very good results. And compared to the cranial, uh, you know, I think spinal radio, radio surgery, it's not of much uh, benefit compared to the cranial ones. So, uh, so these are few, some of the few comments I'd like to make. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Pravid, you wanted to speak something? Uh, yeah, just a few points about this <coughs> dural AVF. First of all, thank you very much, all the speakers, for such a riveting presentation on dural AVF. Well, just a few points uh, from my side are. <coughs> Sometimes it is this uh, AVF and AVM, they are confusing, both uh, theoretically as well as intraoperatively, especially for the genius. So uh, the only point that I would like to uh, tell about this uh, difference between these two are AVF. Uh, in case of AVF, it is fistula. The main passage is the fistula, whereas in case of AVM, it is the nidus. So nidus and fistula, these are, to, these, uh, these are totally different uh, pathological findings in these two entities, AVF and AVM. So in case of AVF, we should try to find the AV, uh, fistula. And if the fistula, we can obliterate the fistula, then uh, in most of the cases, the whole scenario disappears, as the Dr. Amit showed by apply, applying the temporary clip. So this is, this is the basic uh, difference between two, these two AVF and AVM. And I think uh, regarding the surgical management uh, of this AVF, uh, I think this is the field of neurosurgery where definitely inter radiological intervention or neurointervascular intervention proves to be better, more helpful, and superior uh, as far as the technical you know, things are concerned. So um, uh, in most of the cases, I think uh, neurointervascular intervention is the choice of treatment. Uh, for such conditions, especially because uh, by this neurointervascular intervention, we can approach by both venous and uh, transvenous and transarterial route, as uh, Dr. Manoj very nicely demonstrated. Uh, and uh, technically, also sometimes it is very difficult uh, by open surgery. It is very difficult to find the exact fistulous point that has been shown uh, in the in the angiography. In angiography, you can see the things very clearly. Um, this is the fistulous point, and this is the point where we should occlude. But the same thing is very, very difficult to find uh, in the open surgery. So in that sense also, I think this intervention is uh, much uh, superior and better. Uh, but definitely we need to be expert enough uh, while dealing with this type of lesion uh, by endovascular. And third thing, third thing is whether we go uh, by the open surgery or by endovascular intervention. Again, um, uh, emphasizing uh, from my side is trying to find the fistula, fistula, and fistula. Unlike in case of ABM, there are multiple venous drainage, multiple feeders, and we have to find all those, all those feeders and um, uh, drainage, and we have to obliterate everything and finally take out the AVM. But in case of AVF, it is the fist that we have to find, and this is the only thing that we have to uh, occlude. Um, and in that sense also, it is uh, easier than AVM. So again, I think uh, this uh, intervention uh, would be a better choice uh, to find and to obliterate uh, um, uh, the fistula um, uh, from technical side. I think uh, this is all that I have to mention. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any, 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 anyone else would like to give his comment? 
Yeah, excuse me. Mr. Azeeb, Gopal. Okay, there's a question from Gopal. I just took his name. Uh, his question is, how do we pick up four of this fistula? Any guidelines? May Manoj can answer this question. Uh, as I said in my presentation, like uh, maybe we are missing many of these cases because the most common uh, clinical symptom is tinnitus and they mostly go to ENT and they may be diagnosed as Meniere's disease or other ENT uh, related diagnosis. So uh, I think we should uh, collaborate with ENT surgeons in our institutes and we could request them if you have such kind of symptoms, uh, patients having only pulsatile tinnitus or brew. And they could refer to us and we could at least do uh, non-invasive angiography like MRA or uh, to uh, diagnose or to pick up more cases but of course they are rare entities so uh, we'll not experience so many cases as our senior neurosurgeons have already mentioned but we may be under diagnosing I guess we may not be doing angiography because that's the only uh, uh, like standard diagnostic modality so that maybe like we can collaborate with ENT people. Maybe. And also sometime with the ophthalmic people, you know? Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Manus, do you have the data that how many cases of tinnitus actually end up having this uh, DAVF? That is important. Like yeah. how many angels you have to do, number needed to treat kind of thing? Mm. Uh, I think I should look into that. So right now I don't have any such paper. But uh, talk to the year with this data so that you know, yeah. like 100 tinnitus, 10 will be AVR. Then we can make a point to them that please send to us. Because yes, in neurosurgery, almost in all specialties, under in all sub specialties, under detection is the problem. Like carotid endarterectomy, you know, we should have so many carotid endarterectomies, and we are doing so fewer. Where are all the cases? Uh, every day, we, every time we do some presentation, we we have the, this. No, from the time you agree. <laughs> so either these other yeah, neurologists are not. Yeah, the neurologists are not referring the cases because everybody wants to hold cases by themselves. You know, you know all these. Uh, you know, orthopedic surgeon who do not do PIVD, they don't refer cases to us, and it's it's uh, in so everywhere. <laughs> no? So recently, I have noticed one thing. You know. Hmm. There is suddenly an increase in number of acoustic neurinoma in our series, oh. in our institute. Okay. So okay. ENT people have started doing MRI on mm -hmm. unilateral sensor neural hearing loss, which they were not doing in the past. So suddenly, you know, so Monod may be right, you know, in saying that, you know, maybe educating the ENT people and then, you know, trying to find out, unless you do a very nice angiography, you will not see uh, the yes. dural AVF so many times. Recently we did one uh, AB fistula you know, which was a keratic or carovernous fistula mm -hmm. and the feeder was mi uh, middle meningeal artery. Okay. So we actually did a surgical you know like of the middle meningeal artery which was a very very straightforward case and this uh, we did on local anesthesia. A patient was awake and did uh, pretty well. Uh, so recent, uh, I remember this case, you know, just maybe a month back or so. Well, one case actually, Gopal also knows, uh, back in 2005, one patient lady, 40 year old lady with a history of head injury and she had contusion. And six weeks later, she came with classic features of CC fistula. You know, pulse eye swollen, red, and you know, that time we had very limited resources and discussed with the family. And I did internal carotid artery ligation at the neck, and it just disappeared. I had told her there is a 10% risk of uh, stroke and all, everything, because that was the only option. Uh, and then that patient did exceptionally well. She came after eight to 10 years later with some other unrelated problem, and that was the time. We, did, we had the opportunity to meet her. So sometime in a very desperate situation, that treatment is also in the list for CCF. Absolutely, Absolutely. you know, yeah, I, I call it revisiting the old technique. And um, if, you, if you can do that on awake uh, stage, you know, 
and then that will be the most efficient and you can look at it on the table with the Doppler and um, gradual occlusion of carotid, which was being done in the past, you know, to put mm -hmm. a device, which the patient can themselves, you know, gradually tighten their carotid. Uh, there is a device like that. And then I think that was a wonderful idea. Yeah. Um, muscle, muscle piece, which is tied on the uh, uh, thread and then like flying a kite, kite technique, which is called, which was also used in the past. You know, these all small, small techniques may still be useful at times when, uh, but then we have people like Manoj and, uh, you know, a lot of intervention people. So I think, uh, you know, uh, they can do a better job, especially on carotid carotid fistula by trans arterial transvenous route. And uh, yeah, but carotid ligation is uh, still there. I mean, yeah. uh, you can try that. You know, if, if it's really, really difficult CCF, because most of the time, if you look at the angiography, then all the blood is going into the ophthalmic vein, you know, and nothing is going into oh. the um, uh, brain itself. So that artery is not working at all. So ligating that artery is not going to do any harm most of the time. This actually reminds me of, uh, I think Pawan sir would remember that case. There was a case in beer where the similar device was used and every day we had to, you know, screw it slowly. Sylvester, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. We had to yeah. screw it slowly for a case of CCF and it was really effective actually. I think we should wind up, Yam. I think it's already yes, six o'clock, two hours. Yes, Please, stop and close, guard, you know. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, I'd like to especially thank you all the speakers for excellent and wonderful presentation, which has uh, truly highlighted, you know, all the pathogenesis, marriage range, surgical diagnosis, everything. Uh, for this rare and uncommon disease, which we are, you know, very few of us will encounter in our uh, career, I think. And once again, I'd like to thank uh, Nissan for that, uh, you know, for conducting this, especially Dr. Amit. And he has already given the next topic for, I think, is on high grade climbers. Uh, so, with these uh, few words, uh, I would like to thank everyone for participation in this uh, our weekly webinar. Thank you very much. Have a good day and be safe. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Bye-bye.